Welcome everyone. The service has been great so far. The worship, powerful. The hosts, great. Some exciting things happening at the church, but I don't know about you. I am ready to jump into the word. So would you join me in the place of prayer as I get ready to dive in and see what God has to say to us. Lord, I thank you that I get the awesome privilege to share with individuals you love deeply. I pray this word go forth to make an impact that only you can make. And may they apply it in a way that makes sense to them via the Holy Spirit. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you've been trekking with us a little bit, we've been going through a journey this 40-day journey of renewal. And as we're on this journey of renewal, we're looking at what it means to be revived or refreshed. And now, more specifically, what does that mean in the place of prayer when we engage prayer in our time of renewal? See, prayer is simply communing with God. It's a two-way conversation. And God, you can talk to him about any and every area of your life or anything you want to. That's what prayer is all about. It's a communing with the creator and with your creator who loves you. With that in mind, I want to talk to us this weekend about praying for change, praying for change. Now, when I say praying for change, I, I, I don't want to too quickly, automatically make it about changing us. And though we can change in the place of prayer, I'm not specifically talking about simply personal change, though that may happen. But for the sake of today, I want us to look at praying for change as it relates to people, as it relates to society, as it relates to your neighborhood, as it relates to this region, as it relates to your office or where you work or where you go to school. But praying for change in the sense of God awakening those around you to him or praying for revival, some call it. And when I think about praying for change, what I'm trying to capture is prayer where we're standing in the gap for someone or somebody or some neighborhood or some country or whatever it is. When we stand in the gap, uh, there's another language or another word for use in scriptures to intercede in the place of prayer. So praying for change as it relates to this talk is about intercessory prayer. Because at the end, end of the day, when I intercede, I want to see change. I want to see change. Richard Foster, the, the author, uh, says intercessory prayer is selfless prayer, even self-giving prayer. It's, it's, it's prayer that has God's mind and perspective on a situation or a people group. And it's saying, I'm going to take on this mantle of prayer to intercede and believe God for change. Here's the thing, though. Sometimes in Christian culture or in Christian circles, people hear a word like intercession. When I say praying for change is intercessory prayer. And they think it's like for an elite group of Christians that only get to go before a holy God and begin to pray for change. I, I want you to know something. It's not for an elite group of Christians. It's for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. If you're a child of God, if you walk with the Lord, you are a ripe candidate to pray and intercession intercede for change. That's you. And you say, based on what authority? Good question. In fact, Romans 8, 33 through 34 reminds us the authority we have or the access point we have or the standing we have to be able to intercede and pray for change. Let's look at Romans 8, 33 through 34. It reads, who will bring any charge against them, those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life. Get this, here's the crux. Is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. This is a very sobering truth. 
one of the functions of Jesus Christ post his death, burial, and resurrection as he ascended into heaven is to sit at the right hand of the Father and to intercede for us and to go on our behalf and pray for us as he is there in his heavenly places. And so this tells me then when I'm praying under that authority, I understand that I pray on the basis of God's work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. So Jesus' blood qualifies me for a person who can pray for change. Not just that, when I'm praying or interceding for, for change, listen, I'm modeling the nature of Jesus himself, who according to Romans 8, 34, is doing that on our behalf. Why do I share all this? Because I don't want anyone listening to sidestep their responsibility or their access point to know, hey, I can pray for change. It's not for an elite group. It's not for the Navy SEALs of Christians. It's not for the, the sniper team of Christians, so to speak, that are these elite armed force people. No, it's for each and every one of us. When I think of a person in scripture who interceded and prayed for change on behalf of a people, I think of Moses. Moses, and I'm going to head over to Exodus 32, 9 through 14 in a moment. But I want to give you, I want to color the picture in a bit for you what was going on contextually or historically. Moses at this time was learning what it meant to lead broken people. People like you and I. And this is post parting of the Red Sea. So he got them out of captivity by the power of God from Pharaoh. They were enslaved. And now he's leading these people. And now they're going and they're at months uh, at this point, they're at months at Sinai. And now being at Sinai, the Jewish people had promised to obey God. They said, hey, God, you rescued us, man. Our lives are going to be a big fat thank you to you. So we're going to obey you from this day forward. And, and man, God, listen, God knows our frailties, man. He, he knows they weren't going to hold up their end of the bargain, so to speak. And sure enough, it happens. One day, Moses is up on the mountain seeking God for an extended time on Sinai and the people were getting impatient they wanted more instruction they wanted to know what to do so in their impatience they gathered all the gold they can find within their community melted it and then erected a golden calf from it and that golden calf is what they decided to worship and that was who they decided to have represent them not the one true God the golden calf that they had just erected and you may go man that's strange listen it was strange. We could do the same, and I'll explain in a bit. But he goes, they go on to do that. Now, my, Moses is still on the mountain, and God essentially, the, the, you know, the Bible according to Lionel, God lets Moses know, hey, uh, Moses, your people are tripping, dude. They're wilding out down there. I think you should get back down there because I'm about to deal with them in a moment. And so uh, let's, let's go see what I need to do. So get back down there because they're, they're bugging out. They just erected a whole false idol. And now we see this Conversation between God and Moses. Exodus 32, 9 through 14. It says, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. O oh Lord, he said. Why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that you brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent. Do not bring disaster on your people. Verse 13. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel? To whom you swore by your own self, I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And I'll give your descendants all this land I promised them. And it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented, did not bring on his, did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. I want to lift a few principles from this interaction, this dialogue, this time of prayer between Moses and God. 
And if we're going to be effective at interceding for change or praying for change, we need to remember this first principle that God is for God. You say, what? Yeah, I'll explain it. God is for God. Verse 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12 make it plain. Look how Moses appeals to God. It says, Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? And then he goes on to say, why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of this earth? When Moses hears what God threatens to do, Moses immediately appeals to God's glory. He appeals to the sense, hey God, you're concerned about your reputation. You're concerned about what others say. Don't let let, don't let the wicked speak evil of you. And don't let them say, hey, he brought his own people out just to wipe them out on Mount Sinai. Listen, what Moses was doing, and I think, and I'll repeat this, that Moses kind of is in this training ground on leadership with God. But what Moses is appealing to is God when you are for God. What does that mean? God, you are all about your glory. It is all about you, God. And, and you know that. Now, I know that's a hard truth to to ingest when we live in a culture that makes it all about us. We, we live in a culture that lends itself to radical individualism and my dreams and my wants and what I desire. And I'm not saying ever, all that is bad. I'm simply saying at the end of the day, God is for God and we exist to bring God glory. That takes in hu a humility to own and Moses understood that if I'm going to get audience with God and appeal to God, I'm going to bring back to him, Lord, it's about your glory. Don't let anyone speak negatively about your glory. And, 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 and I love how Moses understands that truth. And I would argue if we're going to pray for change, we need to adopt the same level of thinking that it's about the glory of God. Even Jesus models that in the Lord's prayer when he says, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Here it is. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's all about God. It's all about the Father's will. It's all about his glory. And that's where we start in the place of prayer. God is for his glory, man. And one of the ways he gets glory out of our lives is not just when we posture our prayers like that, but it's what A.W. Tozer says, our whole life must pray. The whole life must pray. And it's not just I say, oh, God, you're for God. You're for your own glory. It, it means I function. I walk in obedience to God's revealed will. Will It's not perfection. It's simply saying my heart is bent towards righteousness to walk in obedience. Why? Because it brings attention to the glory of God. When I think of God's glory, I'm reminded of the time when I was a fourth grade teacher in an inner city in New Jersey. And a, a lot of my students had never attended a Broadway musical. They can be very expensive, so I understand why. The reality is this though, I had a friend of mine who was in the musical Spider-Man. And I said, hey, I'm going to write a letter to the director. Do you mind putting it on his desk so we can have some tickets donated to these fourth grade students who had never been to a Broadway musical? So I prayed about it, wrote the letter, sent it over, and sure enough, the director was moved and said, we're going to donate 100 tickets, which meant that was the entirety of not just my class, but multiple fourth grade classes. And I know, and if you know, maybe you've been stateside, if you're watching from another country or you are in the States, you know there's a certain decorum or way you're supposed to comport yourself at a Broadway show. And so, man, let me tell you something. I had the longest talk with those students leading up. I said, there's a certain way you need to comport yourself. There's a certain way I need you to function in that setting. Why? Because if you misbehave or you do something out of sorts, they're not simply going to 
look at you and say, oh, look at that, that child. They, they have no home training. They have no, up, no proper upbringing. They're going to look at the name that's on your shirt, the school name and the town was on their shirt. And they're going to say, it's that people group or those people from that town. They don't know how to react. What I was trying to get them to see is that they carry a certain name by the way they comport themselves. I want to remind you, us believers, those that call ourselves Christ followers, we carry the name of God by the way we comport ourselves. And God is for God and God is for his glory. So we need to be mindful of the way we comport ourselves. And we bring all that in the place of prayer. Moses understood that. Moses appeals to God's propensity to be recognized that his glory needs to be lifted up and he, he, he appeals to that. So God is for God. That, that's not the only truth we see. We see this other truth that God is for people. If we're going to pray for change, we need to remember it's not just, he's not just sitting up there only consumed with himself. No, God is for people. He is for people as well. In verse 10, it's interesting because he, he calls them a stiff-necked people in verse 9. He goes, hey, these are stiff-necked people. And essentially, they're hard-headed. They're numb skulls. I, I tried to get them right. And then he tells Moses this. Look at verse 10. He says, now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I'll make them into a great nation. Now, it's interesting because a lot of scholars have debates on did God, did Moses really change his mind or whatever the case may be. I'm not going to get into that debate. I simply know that Moses was in a training ground for leadership and Moses heard and heard the threat that came to say, hey, I'm gonna, I can give you a whole new batch of people. These people haven't been acting right. They've been tripping. Ever since they got out the Red Sea, they haven't been acting right. So now, Moses, I can give you a whole new batch of people, and we can start all over, and you'll still get, you know, you'll still do what you have to do. But Moses does not take him up on that offer at all. Moses loves that people. And he asks God to relent. And, and he asks God, no, this is not the way I want it done. And I'd argue that God was pleased with Moses' response. I'd argue that that's the response God wanted from Moses to say, hey, you're God. Because remember, this is the same God that's described as compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in mercy. This is the same God that the scripture talks about. And so when he gives Moses this out, Moses says, no, I'm not taking that out. Why? He understood that God is for people. And what blows my mind is that Moses could have easily been offended by these people. They essentially didn't respect his authority. They didn't respect his leadership. They, they simply thought he was taking too long. They were frustrated with him. And, 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 and they're like, you know what, forget Moses. Forget the God of Moses. We're going to erect our own God. And he doesn't allow their nonsense to affect his prayer life towards them. It, it reminds me that sometimes God may challenge you to pray for a people group, to pray for a, 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 a city, to pray for a person that you may not necessarily like or they may not be treating you right or they, it, it, may be, it may be something that's hard for you to do because you have your own perspective on them. But I want you to know that it, it's not for you to make the final judgment. God is for people. It's for us to continue to lift them in prayer. And I think to myself, imagine Moses was so offended by those people that he wouldn't pray. He didn't allow his offense to hinder his prayer life for them. He still went before a holy God and said, God, they're not a perfect people, but I love these people. And may you relent in your anger. When I think of somebody that had to own what it meant to pray against or for a person that offended them or hurt them. I think of a buddy of mine 
I'll just say his first name, Pastor Danny. He was a pastor in the inner city. And he was pastoring a church that was literally right next to the projects, one of the toughest projects in that city. And while he was pastoring, though he wasn't from there, though he came from a way different <laughs> demographic and background than the people he was serving, he knew God had it on his heart for him to be there. And one of the individuals he was ministering to was strung out on drugs. He was addicted to drugs. And Danny worked at one of these churches where his house was right next to the church. So everyone knew where he lived. This person must have had uh, 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 been in a state where he wanted his fix. So he's willing to steal and go after whatever. So he literally breaks into Danny's house while Danny is present. And, and when he gets in, not just Danny's there. Danny and his small children and his wife are present. Danny meets him at the door. Now, I remember clear as day when Danny's telling me this story, man, and I'm going, wow. I, I'm like on the edge of my seat. What, what's about to happen? And Danny meets him at the door. He sees Danny and automatically he's almost embarrassed but gets violent. So he starts to push and to swing on Danny. And I remember him telling me, he said, I kept telling him, I love you too much. I'm not going to hit you. Jesus loves you too much. I'm not going to hit you. Can I just take a quick time out right there and let me step out that frame real quick. I'm not sure I got the anointing that Danny had at that moment. That happened to me. Or you, you might have automatically went into punch, punch, uppercut mode. I don't know what mode you would have went into. But I know God showed up in a real way. So let me take myself out, go back into that story, and finish it off. Danny makes this commitment not to touch him. And he said finally he got tired of swinging and everything. He just stormed out the house. Danny said it must have been the Lord who still put him on his heart because he would pray even more furiously for that man's life. He would pray that God show up in a real way and break that addiction and, and, and save him and, and, and experience that that man may experience the grace of God. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, it was his report that said, you know who that person is? Then he named that person. What was interesting, that was one of the key leaders in that church at the moment. He said, you would never know that's what his story was but guess what Danny never gave up on praying him in to the kingdom let us never forget that God is for people people may hurt you people may offend you they may say something you don't like it may be a city that God has put a burden on your heart you're like I don't even like that city I don't care how you feel God hasn't given up on them you and I should not give up on them we continue to lift them up in the place of prayer as Moses lifted up his brothers and sisters in the place of prayer in the midst of offense God is for people my last and final point that we need to hold dear to if we're going to pray for change, if we're going to intercede for change. Now, it's not just God is for God. Yes, he's about his glory, but God is for people. He loves us deeply, even in our brokenness. But lastly, God is for change. He's for change. Exodus 32, 13 through 14 reads, Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And I'll give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Verse 14, then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. We must remember God is for change. And, and it's not change for the sake of change. God doesn't just change or he wants change because he's some progressive God that's trying to keep up with the Joneses. When I speak of God wanting change, it's this. When we look at society, society doesn't match what God's revealed will is in scripture. And what God wants is the harmony in heaven to invade earth. And that's the change he's looking for. Change where society lines up with what scripture says about 
God's heart and will for his people. The kind of change God wants is not just that we see the alignment in scripture, but there's a chuck full of promises in scripture that we can hold to that God is like, hey, I want my promises to be fulfilled on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what Moses taps into in the place of prayer. He brings a promise back to God to say, Lord, you're for change. You're for your promises. In fact, he references a promise from Genesis when he says, hey, you said to my forefathers that I'll make your descendants as broad, as big as the stars in the sky. And he is saying, hey, Lord, you made a promise to them generations ago, and, I, and I'm bringing it to you in the place of prayer to keep it. And what I love about this is Moses wanted to see that promise manifested before him. Let us learn that when it comes to praying for change. I don't just pray for the sake of my own opinion. When I go to the place of prayer, I need to bring a promise of God that I could stand on in that word to say, Lord, you said you'll meet all my needs according to your riches and glory. You said you're slow to anger and abounding in mercy. You said it's your will that all men and women come to a saving knowledge of you. So when we're armed with a promise and prayer I want you to know you can stand on that promise in the place of prayer and that's what Moses does see when I'm praying God's promises there's benefits there because you know sometimes we don't get an answer prayer because the word says we're praying amiss we're outside of the will of God but you know that a promise in scripture is God's revealed will so you have a confidence in prayer also I love praying promises why because God responds to his word and Isaiah 55 11 tells me that his word will not return void so let us in the same manner of as Moses arm ourselves with a promise of God in the place of prayer. You can never lean on a promise too much. There's no such thing as I'm standing on a, on a promise from God too much. There's no such thing. There's no such thing at all. No amount of leaning on a promise will ever break that promise because God is a promise keeper. He's for change. Moses appeals to him. But the promise, he appeals to him to say, God, you said you were going to show up. And God answers. And it says he relented. And Moses got what he was after. And I believe that was a day that Moses added another notch under his belt to be a more formidable leader. To say, God, you can trust me to lead these people. Why? Because I have their heart. And more importantly, I have your heart for them. Remember that, ladies and gentlemen, that as you hold on and believe God for those promises that you're saying, hey, Lord, I want you to show up in my city like never before. I want you to show up in my neighborhood like never before. I want you to show up on my job like never before. You need to understand that as an ambassador for the kingdom of God, as a child of God, you have the power to pray for change right where you are. Don't sidestep that responsibility. Don't shirk that responsibility. Don't put it on your pastor or a leader or your life group leader for that responsibility. That responsibility is on you and you'll be blessed for it, and people are blessed for it as they come in contact with you. I'll close with a person in history that wanted to pray for change. He was a lay leader. That means he held no position or no office in a local church. His name was Jeremy Lanfear. And he always hoped for more. They brought him in at this dying Dutch Reformed church to say, hey, would you be willing to hold a prayer meeting once a week? It was in, on Fulton Street in New York where this prayer meeting would be held once a week. And it was September 23rd, 1857 was the first one around lunchtime, on people's lunch break. He was a little discouraged because as he passed out the information, only six people showed up at that first one. But he didn't allow only six to stop him from believing for change for his city. When the six people showed up, he kept trekking along every week, and they said, 
at about the third week, though, there was about 40 participants who showed up. So when 40 finally got there, they said, oh, we might be on to something. Let's begin to pray daily around lunchtime and see what God, excuse me, God does. That started on October 10th. Do you not know? Six months from the day they said they were going to pray daily going forward, six months from that day, about 10,000 people were gathering to pray daily in that church at New York City. 10,000 people going. It surely was a, an awakening. Some scholars call it the third great awakening. In fact, they said people began to take an interest in prayer all over the country. In Chicago, at the Metropolitan Metropolitan Theater, there were 2,000 people praying at lunchtime. In Louisville and a Masonic temple, there were 2,000 people praying at lunchtime. It started to spread all over again. Most scholars said it was a great awakening that just didn't stop stateside. They said it spread to Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England, Europe, South Africa, India, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. And it wasn't based on preaching or emotive stuff like that. It was a revival based on prayer, a prayer that awakened the soul, a prayer from a, a young man by the name of Jeremy who simply wanted to see God change his city and revival spread. He had no office in his church. He had no official title. You don't need any of the above to be impactful in prayer. All you need is a willing heart and a heart that cries out to God on behalf of your people. And I'll close with the way James Buchanan summarized this great awakening, if you will. He said what it meant was at the time, new spiritual life was imparted to the dead and new spiritual health was imparted to the living. God moved because someone prayed. Always remember, you're a product of prayer. I'm a product of prayer. Somebody prayed me into the kingdom. I wonder what God's going to do through you. I wonder what burden he's stirring up in you during this season to say, I want you to pray for this city or this people group or your job. I wonder what God is stirring in you. I want to pray for us, and I'm just simply going to pray that we posture ourselves to hear from God and be faithful with the burden or the people group or the person he's putting on your heart. Would you join me in that place? So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We know more than anything you would like to see change in the world around us. May we posture ourselves to be those you can trust in the place of prayer. Those that will be consistent in bringing a people group, a city, calling out for revival. Whatever we need to do to see the change manifested before our eyes. May we simply be faithful with our assignment. May this not just be another word we hear or critique or judge, but may it be something we own, something that we take to the bank, so to speak. Something that either for some of us affirmed and confirmed what we've been doing, and for others, may it be a jump start to get us praying as you see fit. It's in Christ's name we pray. I'm excited to see what comes about. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, the most important question or the most important thing or question you're going to have to answer is what are you going to do with Jesus? He loves you. He's for you. He's after your heart. More than just religious commitment, he wants a relationship with you. And if that's you and you're saying, Pastor, I want to know Jesus for myself, would you pray this prayer right where you are? Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Change me. Wash away my sin that I may know you, that I may live for you, that I may walk with you from this day forward. 
as Lord of my life. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you pray with me and you meant business with God, follow the promptings on that screen. I want to congratulate you. Those promptings will help you understand where do I go from here? Because I prayed this prayer, how can I buoy my faith or anchor my faith? I just want to invite you and encourage you to continue to check us out or maybe even consider coming in person. But welcome to the kingdom of God. Well, I hope you stay tuned for the rest of this series and this journey we we're on for a journey of renewal. Enjoy the remainder.